So welcome everyone and thank you for joining the sixth panel of Carl's Inclusion Perspectives webinar series, which will feature library colleagues with intersectional identities and has been organized by Carl's Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Working Group. I'm Julie Moray, Senior Program Officer at Carl. Before we begin, please note that simultaneous translation in both French and English is available for this session and can be accessed using the interpretation icon in the bottom right corner of your Zoom window. Une traduction simultanée en français et en anglais est disponible pour cette session et est accessible via l'icône d'interprétation dans le coin inférieur droit de votre écran. I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge that today's panelists and attendees are joining us from the unceded territories of many Indigenous peoples who have lived and worked on this land for millennia and continue to do so today. My home and the Carl office located here in Ottawa, capital of the country we now know as Canada, are built on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. We welcome you to add your own acknowledgements into the chat and to honor and recognize the ongoing contributions of the first peoples of these lands. I would also like to take this opportunity to go over the logistics for the session. Participants have been muted upon entry. You are encouraged to type your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Links to the Carl Code of Conduct have been included at the beginning of the chat thread, and the organizers of this webinar are committed to providing a welcoming, professionally engaging, and safe experience. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact Susan Haig, Carl Executive Director, whose contact information has also been listed in the chat. Auto-generated captions have been enabled for this webinar, which is being recorded. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session. Paige Maylott is an accessibility specialist at McMaster, where she previously graduated with honors from the English and Cultural Studies Department. Her thesis work centered intersections of queer autobiography and critical illness. Paige has worked in the accessibility field for nearly nine years and five in her current position. She chairs the Unifor 5555 Pride Committee sits on a number of other equity deserving committees, is the contest manager for Grit Lit Literary Festival, and is an accomplished author herself. Paige's debut memoir, My Body is Distant, releases this September uh, through ECW Press. Welcome Paige, and without further ado, I invite you to lead our discussion today. Thank you so much. Uh, so hello everyone. Thank you for coming to the sixth episode of Carl Inclusion Perspectives webinar series featuring people who have intersectional identities. My name is Paige Maylott. I'm a trans woman with an invisible disability working as an accessibility specialist within McMaster University Libraries. McMaster Libraries actively encourages uh, employees to expand their scope and engage in productive committee work. And in that capacity, I sit on many diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility or DEIA uh, committees. Um, such as our library's DEIA committee, our Inclusive Cultures Working Group, the Indigenous Matters Reading Group, as well as chairing our local union's pride committee, as, as was previously discussed. Uh, I work and live in Hamilton, Ontario, which is seated upon the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations, and within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. However, today I'm calling in from Thunder Bay, uh, a stone's throw from Lakehead University, which is located on the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. I encourage you to research Indigenous resources, such as nativeland.ca, and investigate the lands which you share. Uh, bearing in mind the theme of today, I would like to celebrate genderful and two-spirit people by reading briefly from Kelsey Klassen's excellent article, Two Spirits, One Struggle, The Front Lines of Being First Nations and Gay. Klassen writes that historically, individuals with cross-gender identity were revered in First Nations cultures and looked to as leaders, visionaries, and healers. Embodying both masculine and feminine traits, two-spirit people were thought to be blessed with the ability to move between gender roles and were given important spiritual responsibilities as a result. The term two-spirit, while not a new concept, was actually selected during an international conference of gay and lesbian activists in Winnipeg in 1990 to replace the word verdash a commonly used French denigration that translates to male whore. And while it's important to acknowledge that the specific term two-spirit 
isn't used exclusively by all indigenous nations. Fasun goes on to say that for some, Two-Spirit also represents their distinct First, First Nations experiences and traditions, and the way that culture and gender identity are tied together. Gender roles were fluid in pre-colonial societies. Words to describe up to six different gender variants beyond the binary of male and female have been found in 155 indigenous nations of North America. The Cree, for example, refer to them as Ayaku, neither man nor woman. And the Navajo refer to them as Nadlihu, or one who changes. To help individuals determine the gender they were drawn towards, rites of passage were often used. It wasn't until the onset of the federally run residential schools in the late 19th century and the aggressive proliferation of European Christian influences that being gay became stigmatized. As we wrap up the last of our national pride celebrations for the year, which is also a period of time where trans people, particularly trans people of color, face more scrutiny by focused political attacks across our planet, it's important to all of us to reflect upon these indigenous practices and understand that genderful ways of being are not a new phenomenon, for they have always been and always will be all around the world. And I applaud you all today for attending our discussion to not only discuss the ways in which sex and gender can intersect, but also intersect through disability, race, immigrant status, and culture. And before we launch into our discussion today, it's important to first define the term intersectionality. Uh, it was 34 years ago that Black feminism activist and American critical, critical legal, legal race scholar, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, first coined the then obscure legal term, which described the ways social identities can overlap. However, Crenshaw later, just three years ago today, with Time Magazine reprised that famous term by describing what intersex intersectionality means to her today. Uh, and bear in mind that this quote was coined just one month before the COVID pandemic struck and aggressive right-wing populism found new ways to stir up their base within social media. Crenshaw, when asked about what intersectionality meant to her today, said that these days, I start with what it's not because there has been distortion. It is not identity politics on steroids. It is not a mechanism to turn white men into the new pariahs. It's basically a lens, a prism for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. We tend to talk about race inequality as separate from inequality based on gender, class, sexuality, or immigrant status. What's often missing is how some people are subject to all of these. And the experience is not just the sum of its parts, end quote. I believe that such a quote is a fantastic way to launch into our discussion today. Before we do so, allow me to ask each of our esteemed panelists for a short uh, introduction. I'm just going to go through each of their names and then I'm going to call on them individually. We have uh, Ashley Manhas, Claire Laurent, Rachel Chong, and Carly McLeod. And so perhaps I'll, I'll go in order. So um, if you could just give us a brief introduction to yourself, two to three minutes, uh, starting with Ashley, don't mind. Thank you, Paige. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ashley Manhas. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a public services librarian at Capilano University in North Vancouver, BC, located here on the lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and um, Musqueam First Nations. I'm a first-generation university graduate. Um, my grandparents immigrated here from India, and we settled um, in Vancouver Island in uh, what's colonially known as Nanaimo, the lands of the East Nanaimo First Nations. 
I've worked in academic libraries for four years, and I think a lot about what it means to be included in these spaces. Uh, my research interests include onboarding and retention for racialized librarians. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, call on Claire next, please. Hi everyone, my name is Claire Laron. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Metadata and Discovery Librarian here at Portland Polytechnic University at Surrey, BC, um, which is the unceded traditional territories of the Portland First Nation, Musqueam, Katsi, Samyamu, Chawasan, Kikite, and Coquitlam Nations. I'm an early career Filipina Canadian librarian. I graduated my MLIS in 2019, but before that, I was a library technician for seven years. My areas of interest are resource description and access, subject analysis, classification and equity, diversity, and inclusion in metadata. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rachel. Hello. <clears throat> oh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Chong. My pronouns are she, her. And um, I normally work with Claire at Portland Polytechnic University at the Surrey campus, but I am today working from home, as you might have guessed. Uh, and I'm coming to you from the traditional and unceded territories of the Kwantlen, the Kitsi, the Stolo, the Shamanis, the Wasanachuk First Nations, as well as the modern uh, treaty territory of the Tawasan First Nation. Um, at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, I work, um, I've been there for over four years now. And I work as the Indigenous Engagement and Subject Liaison Librarian. Uh, and this last year, they've added and expanded my portfolio to include equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. So I've got both portfolios. Uh, prior to working at KPU, I worked about 10 years in libraries in various capacities uh, from paraprofessional, so clerk, page supervisor, and then getting my MLIS and working um, in various different kinds of libraries, so public, academic, and special. Um, in terms of my identity, I often throw people. <laughs> um, my family is Métis uh, and mixed European. Uh, but my last name comes from my spouse's family, who are uh, Chinese Canadian. And um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. And to round us out, uh, Carly, please. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carly McLeod. My pronouns are she, they. Uh, I'm currently the interim graduate studies librarian in teaching and learning at McMaster University, uh, situated on the lands of uh, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee nations. Um, here at McMaster, I empower students to become more efficient researchers through in-class instruction or through one-on-one -on -one, uh, research consultations. Um, although my path to librarianship hasn't been linear, uh, I've been able to integrate my lived experience into my work. Uh, I'm the first person in my family to go on to post-secondary education. Um, I've worked for a few years, quite a few years as a paraprofessional, um, and I'm proud to be an early career neurodivergent librarian who's interested in critical information skills, uh, research communication skills, and accessibility. Fantastic. Thank you all for coming. All right, so I think we're just going to dive right into some questions. Um, and just uh, to let everybody on our panelists know here, um, I'm just going to open these up to anyone, and um, if we're not getting too many bites, maybe I'll call on, on some specific expertise as we go through. So to get started, um, my first question is, what advice would you give to professionals with intersectionalities that are interested in academic library work? I know it's a bit of a, a broad question, um, but yeah, any any advice? Uh, Ashley? Thanks, Paige. Uh, first of all, an affirmation. You bring an important lens to a field that is striving to diversify the folks who work in it. So for advice in terms of pursuing library work, um, I would say that job postings are increasingly expressing interest in candidates with intersectional identities, and we've even seen restricted job searches for racialized candidates. So if you find yourself applying for a job that highlights a qualification or skill that relates to your identity or that would be strengthened by how your identity can support the work, I'd say speak to it. I've had success with sharing aspects of my lived realities as a racialized person throughout application processes, like in cover letters and in interviews and teaching demos. 
But I would say to also be aware of how comfortable you are sharing, because during interviews, like I've been comfortable speaking to how my identity informs my work with historically excluded students and how this is a strength and a unique aspect of my candidacy for a job. And it's been quite well received, but this is impossible to separate from my personal experiences, which can be like emotionally and mentally draining to draw from, especially with strangers. And it's hard to know how it will be received by our hiring committee. So check in with yourself for like feelings of safety. And then when you're in the field, I would say bring yourself, but guard yourself. Uh, during the Critical Pedagogy Symposium closing keynote conversation with Emily Jerbinski, Baharak Yousafi, and David James Hudson on May 19th, they spoke to the idea of bringing your whole self to work, and they discussed that how we choose to show up can vary day to day. So we're humans, and as I said, our lives are different on different days. But for me, this really resonated, because on one hand, I'm happy to bring aspects of my identity to my work, especially when I'm working with students, as I know that it informs my library practice in a really positive way. But on the other hand, there's times where I don't want to be involved with anything involving my identity. Um, I don't want to perform my identity to exist at work, and it, it can be a place where whiteness is seen as neutral and everything else is marked as other. So it can be challenging to be called on as a volunteer expert or a go-to. Um, I think that there is an issue um, as a racialized woman of being both hyper-visible and invisible sometimes, depending on the moment. So ultimately, my advice is I think it's important to bring yourself your intersectional identity, but guard yourself too, because even with improved EDI fluency in libraries, we're still operating in a very homogenous environment, and that can be isolating at times. So share your story as it relates to your identity when you feel safe to. Let it inform your library practice and guide your practice because it is a strength and it's a very real and valuable component to your work and to our profession. But protect your resources. Feel empowered to engage in uh, only what you have energy for and what aligns with you and let this change day to day because values around equity, diversity and inclusion are not always upheld in libraries and, and intersect Intersectionalities or not, we're all just complex human beings navigating complex situations. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Claire, yeah, you have something to add? Thank you. Sorry, um, they were just drilling in my office. Hopefully you can't hear it. But um, I think Ashley has answered the first question really nicely. So um, just to add to her um, answer, I think that it's important to choose um, an academic library that matches with your values and with your goals. Um, so, for example, if you have specific, you know, if you have a specific academic library that you're looking or interested on, um, maybe do some research. For example, um, read about their EDI or equity, diversity, inclusion statements, and then examine what they're saying versus actually what they're doing. And to do this, you can maybe. Um, see if they have employees like ourselves, like employees with intersectional identities, and maybe um, reach out to them to ask them. Um, you could also reach out to your network of people and maybe ask if somebody can give you a feedback about this institution that you're thinking about. And then finally, if you get an interview, um, I would say um, during the interview process, don't be afraid to ask questions related to EDI, which you think is important for your work and career. And then finally, in terms of resources, and um, I'm sure somebody will put the link on the chat there, um, the ALA website has a, um, a bunch of great resources for um, individuals with intersectional identities. Um, there's a section called um, BIPOC in LAS Resource Center. Um, so many great resources there, including the Green Book for Libraries, um, which is a BIPOC only crowdsourced rating and review system for library information and archival workplaces. I only learned about this um, green book recently, so I haven't really explored it in detail, but it looks like a useful resource um, for BIPOC individuals like myself. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, doing the research, that's fantastic advice. I, I really, I, yeah, I think that that is a fantastic idea and, and even reaching out to the DEIA committees where you're going to be working themselves I think any any extra work that you can do could save you some some stress down the road for sure. Okay, we're going to move on to question number two. I think just in the interest of time, 
Uh, so this is a, a fairly larger, a fairly large question. Um, feel free to break it down into any chunks that uh, interest any of you. Uh, so from library schools to candidate presentations and permanent status and promotion, what meaningful changes can our community introduce in 2023, or I guess looking into 24 now, we're getting toward the end of that now, to see the results of a practical strategy to help Canadian academic libraries attract and retain more library colleagues with intersectionalities. So um, feel free to, to get me to re-ask that, that question. I know it's a bit of a long one there. Um, anybody like to speak on any of those points? Get us started. Um, maybe Carly? Yeah, sure. Um, I can speak to my school experience as a recent graduate of an MLIS program um, just in 2020. Um, so when I was doing my master's, I was balancing full-time work as a library technician at the same time. Um, and because I was working, um, I was not able to get to the university before accessibility services closed um, to do their intake. Uh, and, and because of that, I wasn't able to get formal accommodations during my coursework. Um, you know, I provided feedback to the institution um, and I'm grateful for having a very supportive faculty and a supportive co-op experience as well. Um, if we want to attract diverse learners into the field, there needs to be flexibility and understanding of what diverse learners need to be successful. Um, and be open and responsive with the services to meet those needs. Great, thank you. Um, yes, thank you for that in the chat there. Please post your questions and answers, or your um, your questions, and they'll be logged in the Q&A, and uh, we will um, address them all at the end. Um, any other thoughts on this question? Rachel, great, thank you. Um, I'd just like to reiterate what Carly said. I think many um, now professionals with intersectional identities often enter the profession um, through alternative means. We don't become librarians right away. So I really want to encourage academic libraries to consider how we can support growth from within. Uh, hiring people with intersectional identities as pages, as clerks, and really supporting their growth within the profession uh, to pursue their MLIS and become uh, librarians. Um, not just on this panel, but many of my um, colleagues with intersectional identities have entered the profession through, through uh, paraprofessional opportunities that were um, then encouraged within the institution to pursue their masters. Um, so that's one way we can support our, um, our growth in this area. Another way I think we can support this is through um, offering training, professional experience, and co-ops that specifically target students with intersectional identities to get them that work experience and build their professional networks. Uh, that can be so incredibly valuable. As Carly mentioned, um, was it that you were doing co-op? Yeah, at, at UBC, I did a professional experience as part of my graduation, and that was an incredibly valuable learning experience, both in terms of uh, learning skills for on the job, but also in terms of building my relationships with people in the professional field. And then lastly, the, the last thing I'd add is um, training within the institution, even before you hire people with intersectional identities. If your institution isn't a friendly environment, if you haven't worked to make that environment a welcoming place for people with intersectional identities, even if you do manage to hire them, you might not necessarily be retaining them. So making sure that the workplace is a safe place when you bring people in is really important. So those are my three tips. Uh, look with them, absolutely. Uh, Claire, I saw your hand. Yeah, so uh, just to add to Rachel and Carly, um, last May I attended a session um, on the NASIC conference um, by Tarita Anantecha, I hope I pronounced her name correctly, who is the Director of uh, uh, Inclusion and Talent Management at North Carolina State University Libraries. Um, Tarita spoke about reframing recruitment and retention in libraries, which is related to this question. So for example, in terms of recruitment, um, Tarita mentioned enhancing transparency and uh, having proactive advocacy by being honest about where you are on EDI. Um, it's also mentioned um, setting up candidates for success by, for example, sending the questions in advance. Um, on the BCLA website, the British Columbia Library Association website, um, there's also a resource called 
EDI strategies in recruitment toolkit. And I think um, it is definitely helpful, helpful for libraries and library leaders to read. Um, just to name a few um, of the suggestions outlined in the toolkit include offering accommodations to candidates, acknowledging the value of education and experience outside of Canada, ensuring that there is a BIPOC staff in your search committee and there's more. Um, in terms of retention, um, one of the things that I found um, really helpful in my institution is that investing and supporting in ongoing um, professional developments and training. And so having said that, um, my advice for libraries um, is to invest in ongoing developments, not just for early career um, individuals or library employees, but also for mid-career um, library employees. Um, that's it, thank you. Yeah, I, I really like how everyone seems to be touching on um, looking to elevate people within the library, not just librarians, but all levels of staff. I think that that's a really important point that I, I seeing those connections here between everyone really love that. Um, and also thanks to, to my um, for posting those links in so quickly uh, in chat. That's fantastic. So you can follow along with some of the links that our presenters are, our panelists, sorry, are speaking about within the chat there and um, follow that your research at your own pace. Uh, okay. Um, any last thoughts on this question before we move on? Okay, uh, let's move on to question three. So how can early career or new library colleagues with intersectionalities start thinking about the possibility of career advancement? What does mentorship for folks in this community look like? Um, I think this is a, a really good stepping stone for my last question here. Um, yeah. Fair, yeah, I think that that would be great since you were, you were touching on that a little bit before. Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, I think just like any other career, I would say setting up specific goals and timelines is very important. Um, once you've done that, you can identify knowledge, skills, and experience that you need to develop to achieve your goals. Um, in terms of mentorships, um, I participated in formal and informal mentorships. For example, um, one of the mentorships that I participated in while I was in school is the Vimlock mentorship of Visible Minority Librarians of Canada. And I participated as a mentee and currently as a mentor. And I really liked this program because I was paired up with someone um, who shared the same lived experience as myself. And it allowed me to develop more confidence and also um, to grow my network um, as well. Um, in terms of uh, growing your network, um, I would say um, join as much um, affinity groups, interest groups, or conferences as you can. And I know that conferences could be really expensive um, and not enough funding may be avail available. So my advice is to watch out for scholarships. So for example, um, last May, uh, the NASIC um, conference that I attended, um, I got an equity and diversity scholarship. So that allowed me to actually join a conference in Pittsburgh. So things like that, that really allowed me to, um, to grow my network and to advance in my career as well. Um, in terms of, uh, of course, I'm gonna throw in another literature. In terms of literature, um, I've read an article by Healy Brooks and Lee, uh, 2022. It's called uh, Pairing Up Peer Mentorships Offers Approach in Retaining Librarians of Color. And one of the things that stood out to me is that um, peer mentoring, according to the authors, can help fulfill a critical need by providing um, mentoring relationship, relationships and communities of shared knowledge, which help support and retain library individuals with intersectional identities. Um, They've also added that often librarians and informa information professionals of color participate in a great deal of invisible labor, including mentorship of their peers. And so having said that, um, one, of the, one of the advice that the authors um, said is that um, libraries and institutions can foster peer mentoring by give it, giving um, proper credit or compensating them for this additional labor. Um, this also ensures that those relationships are respected, respected as much as formal mentorship. Um, thank Fantastic. you. Yeah, actually, actually getting paid for, for this labor is definitely important. Good, very good point. And to reach out to our, our communities through committees and working groups definitely um, can improve your reach and your connections. It's great, great ideas. Uh, anyone else like to jump in on this question? Uh, Ashley, thank you. 
Yeah, similar to Claire, I also um, have participated in formal and informal uh, mentorship. I did the VimWalk program too, can't recommend it enough. I received expert advice during um, a job search from an established academic librarian in the same geographic area as me that, like Claire said, you know, understood what I was kind of going through and stuff. Um, for the informal one, though, it was more of a peer mentoring relationship. It was another established academic librarian in the same geographic area as me, um, or sorry, in the same um, in the same university as me. And she helped me get situated as a new librarian in our workplace. Um, and she showed me so much care that I'm extremely grateful for, but she was not compensated at all for her work. And I'm very aware of this. So I raise this question kind of to library leaders, like who's expected to take on the work of mentorship and how do new librarians access it? So for me and this librarian, um, you know, it kind of happened organically and informally, but because I also understood we had shared aspects of our identity. So I trusted her and the relationship kind of developed from there. But the experience really cemented for me that mentorship is necessary, especially in predominantly white institutions, and that it should be recognized as vital and real labor. So my mentorship experiences have been positive, but it also is not a one size fits all type of relationship. And it's important to be aware of the risks that a mentoring approach that replicates like dominant culture um, can have a negative impact on the mentee, like trying to assimilate a new library colleague into the culture or viewing them with just deficits versus building on the individual strengths and needs to welcome them in. And also where the gaps in the institution are, you know, where, where might folks with intersectional identities kind of get caught because of existing processes and stuff. So I think an individualized approach is necessary where the mentees needs are centered um, and that includes social support, navigation of the institution when needed and continuing towards building new skills to support ongoing career development. I absolutely credit mentorship to supporting my career advancement, but again, it only came from people that didn't think I had professional deficits based on my identity, um, like based on age and race and uh, who they perceived me to be or what my path looked like. So I honestly also just give a shout out to colleagues who just create space for us, even like in really informal ways to be librarians or work in libraries and use our skills to advance our own careers too and for the profession. That's wonderful to hear that you had such a, a good experience. Um, but again, this ties back to uh, our previous comment, I believe by Claire, um, about the need for research, right? So you don't find yourself in a, a situation where you might be assimilated or attempted to be assimilated, right? And, and get into that uncomfortable situation where you have to speak out against it. Okay, uh, anyone else like to, to jump in on this? Um, perfect, Rachel, thank you. Um, I don't think I'd consider myself an early career librarian, but I can share past experiences. So I've been a graduate professional librarian now for over 10 years. Um, but when I first <clears throat> graduated, one of the things I did was heavily invest in association work. Um, for me being in British Columbia, I joined BCLA, the BC Library Association, and they had a First Nations interest group. And that's where I started to develop relationships with other specifically uh, Indigenous librarians. Uh, the group's open to everybody, but um, it was nice to have that uh, meeting place where we could gather and share. Um, more recently, uh, I've joined COPO, the Council of Pacific and Prairie uh, University Libraries, and they have an Escopolis mentorship group, which is specifically for Indigenous identifying librarians or even uh, library paraprofessionals. And that's been a really uh, fantastic place to get into some really deep conversations where we don't have to go through their preamble of like explaining ourselves and situating things because there's already that common understanding. And so I think that that group would be a fantastic resource. I wish it was around when I, when I graduated, but I'm really happy to be contributing uh, to that group now and helping to coordinate events. And so I think there's lots of different ways um, to engage in sort of support in that regard. Um, having recently transitioned though into university libraries in the last four years, um, one of the things that I found was really helpful was finding people to collaborate with. Um, 
prior I had worked in public libraries and so I didn't have much experience with the academic side of publishing in particular, and finding people who wanted to collaborate and co-author um, was a really great way to introduce me to the world of publishing and how to go about the publishing process. And um, yeah, I've worked on a number of collaborative publishing <laughs> pieces now, and every time I learn something new from the colleagues that I collaborate with. So it's been a really positive experience. Um, so those are my three tips. <laughs> yeah, great ad, thank you so much. Uh, I think we're going to move along, um, unless there are anyone, no? no? Okay. Uh, number four, what strengths do you bring to libraries? How does it make libraries better? Um, looking toward the positive. Um, and Carly, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Could we get you to jump in on this? Sure. Um, as someone who's neurodivergent, I'm keenly interested and aware of accessibility. Um, so me, myself, I process information differently. I'm a visual learner. I'm dyslexic and I'm also a literal thinker. So the biggest strengths that I bring are my perspective uh, and my accessibility skills because of my lived experience. Um, I'm able to think through processes, provide feedback, ask questions, um, and get the clarity to help innovate or streamline workflows, um, or even to just improve the way that we communicate information to students. Um, really one of my favorite things to do is to collaborate with my colleagues in building accessible learning objects and how to leverage technology in accessible ways. Because I think sometimes folks, um, you know, we want to create accessible things, but the, the process seems a bit scary or daunting and we don't necessarily know how to do that. Um, so I really just help enjoy it and help people to kind of um, like demystify that process a little bit. Um, and I think Anytime that you have pe folks working in libraries um, that have diverse lived experiences who think and or learn differently, um, libraries are going to gain really unique perspectives that help enhance the services that we provide. Um, we help libraries reflect the populations that we serve. Um, and in some ways, uh, this is kind of my own personal take on it, but advocating for students with diverse needs kind of from the inside. That's fantastic. And absolutely, you know, we don't need to to fear accessible technologies. Like we we often adopt those into our our every day to day, right? Like think about how many times you uh you elbowed or or hit bumped one of the door openers over COVID. I mean yeah. it can benefit us all, right? Yeah. Um, okay, great. Um maybe we'll we'll move on. Uh, to number five, just to give us a little bit extra time for these last two questions. Um, what makes you feel proud about your work as a professional with intersectional identities? What gets you up in, in, the, in the morning? Um, Ashley, I see you smiling. Mind if I pick on you? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I love this question. I feel really inspired by what Carly shared as well. Um, I feel proud about my racialized identity as a library professional in an academic setting when it inspires moments of connection at the student level. Um, earlier in the spring term, I was teaching a third year class about interdisciplinary research, and there was a racialized student who was interested in researching Asian movements and history. So we went through some resources together and it was just uh, really amazing to see what she got into during our library session. And later I found out from the course instructor that he had been trying to encourage this student to share her interests with him for the previous five weeks and he had no success. She wouldn't discuss it with him or the class yet she was comfortable sharing with me in a one shot where we had just met and only had a brief amount of time to establish a connection. So I think both of us having racialized identities has a major hand in that without having to discuss it. Um, I understood that her research interests were important to her and treated her research interests with like affirmation and validation and care. And I have many stories like this and I'm sure my fellow panelists do too. Uh, so I know that there are times when my visible racial identity makes me a safe person for students to approach and share with. So that's kind of what keeps me going in the profession, being able to connect with students who may not see many faculty members that look like them in the institution, being a person that students can go to for help, that's everything to me. So I try to center that in my library practice. Great, great point. Yeah, absolutely, representation matters. Okay, Claire, I saw you. You're, you're next. Um, 
yeah, representation absolutely matters, right? And whether we're talking about people just feeling confident to to speak up and and grow within within a library environment, or you know to to be able to have someone one on one to discuss their their issues with without having to bottle that up and feeling uncomfortable about it. It's how we build good communities, right? Good inclusive intersectional communities, absolutely. Uh, Claire, if you don't mind. Well, pick on you um, yeah, just to add to the representation um, idea. Um, so in my in my job at technical services, um, my approach is informed by my cultural background. So as a librarian of color, um, one of the things that I want to implement is integrating um, equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives in our practice of, in technical services, such as decolonizing metadata. And I'm proud to say that we've started doing this in my um, department, um, we, we've recently implemented um, an Indigenous classification to organize our Indigenous um, collection, which is a Brian Deere um, classification. Um, we've also started integrating homosaurus um, vocabularies in our subject headings. Um, homosaurus, if you're not aware, is, um, well, let me read that, it's an international um, LGBTQ plus linked data vocabulary in our catalog. And I think this initiative's um, amplify like underrepresented voices such as um you know myself and so I think that um yes I this inspires me to like to do more. I love the name too home <laughs> it's wonderful. Great thank you so much Claire. Um so we have one more question um just one more reminder I've seen that we are getting at least one or two questions in the QA we want to see some more, um, this would be a good time to start piling them in there and we will get to them right after this question. Uh, so last question, uh, how have you found or built community in your own library context that supports you? And I'd like to actually hear from each of you um, about this and it would be a good way to round out our talk, I think. Um, so maybe um, Rachel, if you don't mind getting us started with this one. Sure, I can start with that one. Thank you, Paige. Um, having moved around to lots of different libraries, I have lots of perspectives about how to build relationships in each different library context. Specifically within academic libraries, I think there's a lot of potential um, to develop relationships, both within your own home library context, but also, also within the institution more broadly. Uh, so I've collaborated with a number of faculty members on different projects, and it's been a great way uh, for me to grow and learn, as well as um, build friendships and relationships within the institution. Uh, but beyond that, um, I've looked to collaborate outside our institution as well with other uh, library professionals. And that's been a fantastic learning opportunity as well. Uh, sometimes it's nice to move outside your institution and get a third party perspective on things and, uh, you know, compare and contrast a little bit about how things operate. Um, and so I've had the pleasure of collaborating with a number of uh, specifically Indigenous librarians at different institutions, um, both in terms of publication and writing, but also um, I teach a course at Langara. Uh, the LibTech program called Indigenous Communities and Libraries, which I co-teach with uh, a colleague of mine, Ashley Edwards, who works at Simon Fraser University. And so finding these different opportunities to gather, to meet and collaborate uh, really helps strengthen relationships and it really helps um, offer an informal support system when you need it and when you need to uh, connect. So I hope that answers the question. Absolutely, it does, thank you. Uh, Claire, how have you found or built community in your library that supports you? So yeah, um, as an early career libra librarian, while, while I was still in library school, um, I subscribed to a lot of listservs. So that's how I found uh, my community because um, I did the MLS program online. So it's, sometimes it can feel so isolating. So um, yeah, I subscribed to a lot of listservs. Um, that's how I found um, Vivlog. Visible Minority Librarians of Canada, and just participating and volunteering in the mentorship program, I was able to um, meet people and grow my network. I'm also in my current workplace. Our university librarian is um, very supportive in you know professional development and mentorship. So I can say I'm fortunate that way. Um, I also found um, a 
peer mentorship system within my colleagues. So for example, um, Ashley um, here um, and myself, we went to library school together. And so Ashley and one other classmate of mine, um, we formed this um, informal mentorship system where we, you know, look at each other's resumes, um, do mock interviews and, you know, give each other feedback and updates on how we navigate contracts and academic libraries in general. So I found that to be really helpful. Um, also, um, I talk to Rachel often, um, you know, to talk about things like navigating your first year as an academic librarian or getting through probation. So that's helpful as well. And then finally, just connecting with um, BIPOC individuals from other academic libraries was really helpful for me as well. Thank you. Yeah, the community, fantastic. Uh, Carly, how about yourself? Yeah, thanks. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with some incredibly supportive folks in the last couple of years. Um, the folks in my current library unit, um, we collaborate, we share ideas, um, and I've learned that it's okay to be who I am. I bring a lot of to the table, I ask a lot of questions, so sometimes uh, I just appreciate them being patient with me. Um, and I've been slowly bringing my whole self to work, as Ashley kind of talked about earlier. Um, you know, besides folks that I've worked with on a consistent basis, I'm extremely grateful for opportunities like this, conferences, workshops um, that showcase diverse perspectives. It's seeing community in different contexts, seeing what's possible um, that allows me to grow both professionally and personally and build out my own network of support. So um, like folks that just mentioned, kind of moving outside your institution, looking for opportunities to collaborate on projects. Um, and oftentimes you have a shared experience and also shared research interests. So that's just been, um, for me, a really great thing to kind of know that I can kind of assemble my own um, community um, and take them with me wherever I go. I feel very fortunate to have those opportunities too at McMaster, it's really great. Um, Okay, so just getting a, a note, sorry. Um, Ashley, you could, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I entered librarianship with a very small network. I was working in records management and was able to meet a couple people through there. But when I decided that I wanted to pursue academic librarianship, I thought, oh, no, I don't know a single person. Um, but it was uh, like Claire mentioned, um, you know, we were able to connect, even though we were doing our programs uh, online, just having messages and an email thread with classmates and then continuing to support each other in our job searches after graduation has been so, so valuable. Um, again, like uh, also participating through formal mentorship that builds builds community, um, and that can be based on your interests, or it can be in your you know meeting someone in a geographic area, whatever is important to you. But uh, community doesn't have to be bound by your physical area that you're in. So before I even connected with um, individuals, I was feeling very isolated, and reading Twitter feeds from libra like from librarians just really helped me find validation for things I was experiencing. So virtual community is just as important. And in addition to like any library related opportunities, because you know, it can take time before you get that capital L librarian or library worker job, just try and make your own support network of folks that you trust, whether they share your identity um, or which aspects of your, your identity you might share or common experiences. Because I receive a lot of support from non-library non friends because we still have shared experiences with our identities. And there's parallels between the issues in this field with like healthcare, social work, nonprofits, government. So you can expand community that way too. Uh, within the library though, I love to go for walks. So as my colleagues um, at CAP uh, and I have found it's important to get outside the library walls, the conversations are much different once you leave the building and you can develop relationships outside of workflows and get to know people. So it's been very healing for me to share experiences in libraries, but also to hold space for others in this way. And that's another way to build community is just to talk. And it's such a huge support on days when you're able to let it out and also to celebrate any wins that you have too. And I think that by sharing our stories out loud and challenging those dominant kind of narratives that we're faced with every day really helps build community and resilience because we have to be resilient in libraries. Um, and then reaching out to offer support just as much as I receive support has helped build community too. And even if you're new to librarianship, 
like Carly's mentioned, you know, you have a lifetime of lived experience that's valuable to share, right? And finally, I think attending virtual talks and presentations like these are a great way to meet people and to be in community with others just wherever you are. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you to everyone for, for being vulnerable and sharing the work that they're doing.